But thank you so much for inviting me today to uh, talk about uh, this idea of simple investing uh, with a few good funds and the concept of the education of an index investor. And my goal today, I don't think is going to be to teach you anything that you don't already know. I think my goal today is more to educate you on perhaps how to introduce these topics to other people, to new people who might be new to the Bogleheads. How do you get these points across to them that we're trying to teach? And, uh, and we try to do that, of course, in any way we can, uh, through writing, through uh, the Bogleheads.org, Twitter. I'm uh, active on Twitter, Reddit. We have now Boglehead Spaces on Twitter. I do the Bogleheads podcast once a month. Uh, so any means that we can disseminate information to people to try to get them to understand what's going on, try to figure it all out so that they can not only help themselves, but also help their loved ones and their friends and the people around them and uh, give themselves and their families a better life, keep more money for, the, for themselves, less money going to the financial services industry, less money going to the IRS, <laughs> more money going to us as investors. So uh, that, you know, that's what we're trying to do as Bogleheads. And this simple presentation of a few good funds is a book I've been working on for a long time. I haven't finished it yet. I'm working on it here and there, hopefully maybe this summer. But it's just uh, a lot of the basic concepts that you already know. And uh, with that, let me go ahead and and get started. So I'm going to uh, grab the uh, screen here and tell me if you see my screen on your screen. We do. Okay, so a few good funds. The genius of simple investing. Uh, so Einstein talked a lot about simplicity. And basically, he said a lot of things about keeping things simple. Uh, he said the definition of genius is taking the complex and making it simple. And I don't think there's anyone in our field who has exemplified that more than Jack Bogle did. He took something extremely complicated and turned it into basic index funds and made investing simple for everyone and then created Vanguard uh, along with that or I should say concurrently with that and allowed us all to just become better educated investors. And uh, it's a very complicated thing investing, but our idea here at the Bogleheads and what with Jack, what he started um, more than 45 years ago uh, has really made it a lot simpler. So this idea of taking the complex and making it simple is what this presentation is about. So, with that, uh, you know, here's my bio. You've already heard about that. I appreciate uh, the work you did on that. Uh, today's agenda, I'm going to talk about what the big main topics of what I have learned over my 35 years doing this professionally and before that uh, during my years in college and when I was actually working on this stuff back in, even in the Marine Corps when I was on active duty. And I boiled it down to, a couple of basic concepts, the three parts of being a successful investor, the education of an index investor, how you become enlightened, how you become a, a good investor, developing your unique strategy, uh, staying in the course. So the, again, very basic stuff, but maybe I explain it in a little bit of a different way uh, to help you explain it to other people. So let's start out with the three parts of being a successful investor. Now I divide it up into three sections or th three mutually exclusive, but coming together to form one good overall method or way of investing that, that works. So first there's the philosophy that you have to embrace. And I'm going to get to each one of these in my presentation. So this really is a summary of what the presentation is about. There's the philosophy of investing. 
there is your strategy, how you take this philosophy and apply it to yourself, your situation. And then thirdly, there is the discipline. And the discipline is the full implementation of the strategy and maintaining the strategy or staying the course. So having the right philosophy, putting together a strategy based on your individual needs, fully implementing it and staying the course, having the discipline to do it. This is how the most successful investors achieve results. And you have to have all three. Having just two of these doesn't work. You can have the philosophy, you can have a good strategy, but if you're not disciplined, it doesn't work. You can have the philosophy, but if you never put together a strategy, then it doesn't work either because it's not the right asset allocation and so forth. And if you don't have the philosophy, you're moving all over the place anyway. So that, that never, that's not even a starter. So let's talk first about the philosophy. And I thought about this a lot for us, the Bogleheads. And this doesn't apply to all Bogleheads because some people out there are a whole lot smarter than me. And they figured this out a whole lot faster than I did. Uh, it took me many years to go through all four of these steps. Um, but other people who I've talked with and I've worked with, they caught on very quickly. Luckily, they had better mentors or a good mentor or they found the Bogleheads early and went straight to the top. But for me, it took me many years to get to uh, the last uh, fourth level of, of this. So they are darkness, enlightenment, complexity, and simplicity. And I'm going to go through each one of these. So darkness. This is uh, generally when we're just getting started. And, you know, we don't know anything. And we're, you know, we don't know what to do. We don't know who to trust. We usually go to our friends. We go to uh, coworkers. What should I do? I don't know what to do here. What funds should I put my money in? Should I be buying Bitcoin? You know, all, all of these things. And so you're, um, you're really in, in the dark. Now, some people think they know what they're doing. They, they read up on the latest hot funds. They read up on when to get in and to get out of the market. They listen to Kramer on, you know, it's time to get in, time to get out. Maybe you shouldn't have a 60-40 strategy. I mean, all these things that are out there that you hear about. And they just try to make sense of it all. Uh, what actually happens with those people is that the markets do well. You as an investor don't do well. And, and over time, what happens is this gap forms, this gap between what the markets are doing and what you're doing. And a lot of that gap is created by fees. Another part of the gap is created by bad behavior, market timing, trying to chase hard trends, getting into arc at the peak. Uh, not to pick on Kathy Woods, but that seems to be what everybody's doing these days. And since she slammed the Bogle heads a couple of years ago in one of her videos, I figured that she's fair game. Um, that, uh, that this performance gap is created. Now, for a lot of people out there who are in darkness, they, this performance gap never goes away because they never realize they have a performance gap. Uh, what happens is that they keep putting money into their portfolio, so their portfolio goes up in value and they confuse somehow adding to a portfolio as being part of the performance that they're getting. And if you recall the Beardstown ladies, in the 1980s, as having a wonderful uh, investment strategy, the Peter Lynch strategy. It was in the 80s and 90s. They became famous, and turns out that uh, they they thought they were outperforming the market, but they were doing their accounting wrong. And the only reason they were outperforming is because they were adding money every month to their account. And once that was actually factored out, they were underperforming significantly. So a lot of people don't understand performance. They don't just, they don't know their their performance is doing poorly. They don't know their this performance gap is being created. Certainly, if you're working with a an advisor or a, you know broker, uh, you know they're they're not gonna they're not gonna tell you 
hey, you're underperforming the markets. Maybe you should do index funds and, and fire me. Um, so, you know, this thing can go on for a long time. And for a lot of people, it does. It goes on for their whole entire life. But um, for some fortunate people, all of them who are on this call today, you something happened in your lifetime where you came to the realization that things aren't right. The, you know, my, my portfolio isn't doing what it should be doing. It doesn't seem to be performing well. I'm reading different places. People are saying different things. I'm hearing about this things called index funds. Uh, am I doing that? How much am I paying in fees? Uh, and I start asking a lot of questions, I actually begin paying attention to the portfolio and their performance and just not listening to it, their broker, whoever it is telling them you're doing great. I used to work uh, when I was in the brokerage industry, I, I worked as, in a partnership with a, uh, a fellow. And every time the clients called, they asked him, you know, how am I doing? He goes, you're doing great. You're doing great. Well, I knew they weren't doing great because I was actually doing the performance monitoring on those accounts and they weren't doing great, but he'd tell them they're doing great. And the clients said, oh, okay, that's, that's just want to hear that from you and, and so forth. But the people who really become interested in how they are actually doing and how much they're paying in fees and how, what is their performance relative to appropriate benchmarks? They begin to learn a lot. They begin to learn that the investment strategies that they might be employing, maybe it's uh, a US large cap equity active fund that they're in. They learn from reading Morningstar or S&P SPIVA scorecard that almost 90% of actively managed large cap US equity funds underperform a basic index fund. And then they learn that's not only true in the United States, but it's true all around the world. And they learn the same thing is true about bond funds and small cap funds and REIT funds and on and on and on as they begin to read and understand that why, why, why don't I just buy index funds? They're low cost. Uh, the cost of, uh, in, this is a, this slide's a little bit old, it's actually come down more, but the, sli the cost of uh, low cost index funds are much lower than active management, both on the equity side and uh, on the bond side. And this cost means higher performance for you. In fact, just looking at this one slide of, if you have an advisor and this advisor is, uh, let's see if we can, this advisor, it's got a million dollar portfolio. The advisor is charging you 1%. They're putting you in actively managed funds. The fees of those are around 0.6. Or you go out and you buy a portfolio of index funds. Same asset allocation between stocks and bonds, same allocation between US and international. Your fund fees are 0.1. What does this cost you using the advisor and the active funds versus just doing index funds. Over a 10 year period of time, you will lose in fees alone on a million dollar portfolio, $212,000 will go out the door in advisor fees and fund fees versus if you just used index funds, those fees would be about 14,000. So clearly a $200,000 difference over a 10 year period on a $1 million portfolio and since we're all going to be living for more than 10 years and maybe our portfolio is worth more than 1 million, you could see that uh, fees matter. And if you can reduce your fees and stop using active funds and just use index funds across the board in all your asset classes and eliminate the advisor or at least use an advisor that has very low cost and maybe fixed cost rather than AUM of 1%, that you will save a lot of money. And and when you get to this point, then you have come to the realization, oops, I've got to clear, clear. Okay. I see that these things are hanging on my screen. So erase, 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 erase. Okay, go on. So now you come to the realization that, you know what? maybe I don't want to do it the Kramer way anymore, the broker way anymore. Maybe I don't want to pay these high fees anymore. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go the Boglehead way. You know, and I think a great starting place for that are any of Jack Bogle's books. Here is my selfish promotion on some of my books, The Power of Passive Investing, 
all about index funds. He also wrote all about asset allocation, the ETF book, Taylor's book, the three fund portfolio. These, these are just great books. So this is the way now, the way, the Boglehead way. And now you have reached enlightenment. You have reached enlightenment. However, this is not true of all people, what I'm going to get into next, but it certainly was true about me. And I know it's true about a lot of people who are Vogelheads. You've reached enlightenment, but now you want to know more. You, you, you want to know everything that's out there. You are ready to absorb knowledge and you start buying every book there is imaginable, including all of the books by those advisors who are advocating other strategies besides the types of strategies that say Taylor would advocate or Jack Bogle would advocate, uh, you start getting into things like factor investing, smart beta, uh, alternative uh, investment strategies, alternative indexing. And you start looking at things like optimization and how can I create a portfolio that is uh, the perfect portfolio, not just a portfolio, but the perfect portfolio, fully optimized, uh, hedged in every way. Uh, and you start adding lots and lots of things to your uh, portfolio as you move along here. And so your little bit of simple portfolio with a few funds becomes a very complex portfolio with 10, 15, 20 funds. So there's a lot of investment advisors out there who feel as though you should have a very complex portfolio, even if you're going to use index funds, uh, they should be 15, 20, 25 funds in your portfolio because because complexity to an advisor is job security. The more complex the portfolio is, the uh, more likelihood you're going to pay them their fee and you're going to throw up your hands. You're going to say, hey, I'm not sure exactly what you're doing here, but it all sounds good. Yeah, it's, it's indexing, I guess, with all these DFA funds and smart beta funds and everything else in there. I mean, if you look at Schwab and portfolios, that's what they do. If you look at Betterment, that's what they do. Just because if you have a lot of stuff in a portfolio, it's more complicated. People get confused by it, but they, it is, you know, the, each of the funds themselves are fairly low cost, but there's just a lot of stuff in there. I call it, well, Peter Lynch called it diversification. And that's, uh, that's what this is. So you get to this point with, uh complexity where should i have 11.3 percent in emerging markets or 11.7 percent in emerging markets and should i divide my emerging markets between emerging markets large cap emerging markets small cap emerging market growth emerging market value i mean you start to get very minutia on all of this and you end up with analysis paralysis you end up not being able to come to a decision on how your portfolio should be managed because you're looking for that optimal portfolio that can only be known in retrospect. We can't know what the optimal portfolio is going forward. We can only know what the evidence has shown us in the past. And you've heard the term maybe evidence-based investing. I don't like that term because that implies that whatever happened in the past is going to happen in the future. So I don't like it. But um, you know, you're, you're confused. You become bewildered. It's like, I, I'm, am I doing this right? You're constantly tinkering with the portfolio and all of that. And if you're lucky enough, <laughs> you realize that at some point and you say, is this getting me anywhere? Is this complexity getting me anywhere? All this factor investing, all these alternatives, all this stuff that uh, I'm supposed to be adding. Are these even indexes or, or not? And over a period of time, uh, you get to this Jack Bogle level, uh, even a Warren Buffett level, which is, I don't need any of that stuff. I need to get back to my original enlightenment. I need to get back to this original simplicity of building a portfolio. I need to get rid of these 25 different funds that I have, and I need to go with a few good funds. And this is where the three fund portfolio comes in, total US stock, total international, a bond fund or two. Um, this is where it comes from. My core four portfolio is basically the same thing. You just need four funds, you can do whatever you want. You do it very simply. You don't need a lot of funds in your portfolio. 
you can you could use one fund in a 401k or an IRA, just use a balanced index fund is all you need. Taxable account, it might require a little more because it's actually more tax efficient to have a US market index fund than an international fund rather than say a global equity fund where you don't get the foreign tax credit. So it's a little bit more complicated on the taxable side, but you just try to keep your portfolio as simple as you possibly can. And guess what? Your fees will be lower. Your taxes will be lower. There'll be lower turnover. And you'll outperform what you would have done with all that complexity. So simplicity is like the ultimate nirvana of indexing. Jack is the epiphany of them. He got there. You know, he got there. And, and it took me a while to get there. You know, I, did, I was the person who went down all the rabbit holes with all of the factor investing and everything else. And uh, it took me a while to come to the idea that, yeah, really all you need is a few good funds. And that's when I developed, started developing the four fund portfolio. Taylor was already onto the three fund portfolio at the time. This probably about 10, 12 years ago. And so this is what I truly believe in now. And um, I think that this is the philosophy of simplicity that you want to grasp. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. Complexity doesn't do anything for you. Certainly being in darkness to it doesn't do anything for you. So somebody had uh, put this up on Bogleheads. They taught it, took what I did and they added some context to it. So the road to simple investing starts in darkness where you might be stock picking, might be doing active funds, market timing, trying to beat the market. You really don't know. And people can get stuck in that. A lot of people get stuck in that their entire life. When you hit enlightenment, you've discovered index funds and you come to, to the passive church, I call it. Remember, we used to call Jack St. Jack. And uh, you've come into the, pers- uh, the church of passive investing. Complexity means you're in the church, but you're kind of sitting way in the back. You're making things much harder than they need to be. You're doing smart beta. You're trying to do alternative investing. You're trying to find some portfolio optimization. Simplicity, you scrap the idea of complexity. You go back to the original idea of enlightenment, a few good index funds or ETFs, and you develop a good strategy for yourself. So this is the philosophy, the philosophy. But now we move on to strategy. So now we've got the philosophy. How do we apply it? How do we apply the philosophy to ourselves? Well, the first thing we have to do is you have to have money. So one of the concepts of uh, the Bogleheads is to live below your means, which simply means you work, you pay taxes, you pay your expenses, and you've got some money to save. So we're living below our means. Now we have some money to invest. How do you do it? How do you create a simple investment strategy for yourself because my strategy is not your strategy. The funds that I use may not be the funds that you use. Why? Because the 401k that I have may not have the same funds that the, of the 401k that you have. I might have my accounts at Fidelity. You might have your accounts at Schwab. Somebody else might have their accounts at Vanguard. And Uh, My tax situation may be different than yours. My income might be different than yours. There are funds that you might use, like municipal bond funds, whereas somebody else may not use municipal bond funds because they're in a uh, lower tax bracket. There's uh, the asset allocation between risky investment stocks and less risky investments, fixed income, would be different for people based on their need, based on their willingness to take risk and their need to take risk, based on their family situation, whether they're accumulating money or or distributing money in retirement. So everybody's different. Everyone's different. We all have the same opportunities to invest in index funds, but which index funds? We're all under the same IRS tax code, but what tax bracket? We all live in different states. Some states have high taxes, some states have no taxes. So all of this stuff matters. And so nobody can say to you, you're not doing it right because you might be doing it perfectly well for your particular situation. And sometimes we get into these arguments, by the way, or I see these arguments on the Bogleheads board and I say, you are arguing about strategy. You cannot tell somebody else that they shouldn't have a corporate bond fund and they should only have a treasury bond fund. You cannot tell them that because their situation is different than your situation. But it's all under the same philosophy. If you're going to have a corporate bond fund, 
it's going to be a low cost corporate bond index fund. If you're going to have a treasury bond fund, it's going to be a low cost treasury bond index fund. So it's the same philosophy. It's just the different strategies. And sometimes I see on the Bogleheads board people arguing about strategy. And it's like, why are you arguing about strategy? What's good for you is good for you. What's good for somebody else is good for somebody else. You might have a CD ladder. That's perfectly fine. You might go out and buy I bonds. Somebody else might not buy I bonds. Perfectly fine. Again, it all fits under the Bogleheads philosophy. But whatever strategy that you're going to use is what's good for you. And this is where you have to figure it out. And so, what is one of the things that really drives a lot of the strategy? It's what do you have available to you? Uh, are you in a 401k, a 403b, 457? I mean, how, what kind of taxable accounts do you have? Uh, do you have an HSA? Do you have a Roth account? Uh, are you able to do mega backdoor Roths, backdoor Roth? Do you have 529s? I mean, you know, taxes really drive investment strategy in many ways. And of course, the, the tolerance for, for risk or your risk level. So the ideal strategy that you would use is the one that fits you and you're different, you're unique. Yes, there's a lot of things about us that are the same, but there's a few things that are very unique about us and that's gonna cause your strategy to be different than other people's strategies. And, and it's all fine. It's all the same philosophy. We're all bogleheads. We all believe in the same stuff. But what we're really trying to do after you get the philosophy, after you capture that, when we try to help each other, what we're really trying to do is for that person, trying to help them figure out what strategy is right for them. Not, not what's right for you and you pushing your strategy on them. That, that's not what this is about. What it's about is what strategy is right for them. And for that, you have to really listen and you have to listen to everything that's going on and, and you ask a lot of questions and you know, figure out about their family and their taxes and when they want to retire and on and on and on and on. I mean, it's just, there's a lot that goes into understanding someone before you can actually say, I think this is what you might want to do. And these are the funds you might want to use. There's a lot of times you, I work with people and they have a 401k, the only decent fund in the 401k is an S&P 500 fund. Everything else is a high cost actively managed fund. Now they're putting money in their 401k just to get the match and the employer is putting money in as well. So money is going in the 401k. And normally we say, well, if you're going to have bonds, a tax deferred fund like a 401k is a good place to put fixed income. But if somebody has really lousy bond funds that have very high fees and they have a really inexpensive S&P 500 fund that has maybe 0.04% fee, and that's the only one that's in there, then you're gonna use that S&P 500 fund. You're not gonna invest in the bond fund in the 401k. So this is what I mean by strategy. Uh, for everybody, it's different. And uh, you have to figure out what is your strategy and, uh, and then you have to uh, implement it. Now, we're really trying to strive for simplicity here. So we're looking within our 401ks and, and so forth for simplicity. Uh, and simplicity to me is a few good funds. I like a total US stock market index fund, an international stock market index fund. These are good funds for all accounts, uh, particularly taxable accounts. Vanguard has a world equity fund and an ETF. And that's uh, great for Roth accounts and for IRA accounts, but it's not good for taxable accounts because you lose the foreign tax credit. So you have to know a little bit about each of these funds and what the underlying indices are that they're following and whether or not taxes are going to influence it. I prefer to have ETFs in a taxable account because they're, you're not going to have any problem with distribution. You know, a lot of people got hurt with the Vanguard target date retirement funds in a taxable account. They got a distribution when they didn't expect it and had to pay a bunch of money in taxes. Well, you're not gonna put balanced funds, you shouldn't have balanced funds in your taxable account. Great for your IRA account, great for your 401k, if it's say a target date retirement fund, a low cost index fund, but not good for a taxable account. So again, what's available to you? Where is it available? Uh, and putting together your strategy. Um, but you're trying to get to a few good funds that represent 
the US market, the international market, and a couple of uh, fixed income funds. Uh, could be a corporate bond fund, could be treasury bond, could be total bond market, could be CD ladder. Again, I don't know what the answer is for any one individual until I've had a long conversation with them to be able to help them make this decision. Some people use uh, uh, MIGAs, uh, multi-year guaranteed income uh, annuities, perfectly fine strategy for, you know, if this is what you wish to do and you're going to keep up with it, no problem. So. Uh, this is what you're looking for though you're looking to keep it simple you're looking to come up with an asset allocation between stocks and bonds and cash that makes sense for you that you could keep for the long term and uh, try to keep it down to as few funds as possible hitting all the big major asset classes what is icing on the cake okay so we've done our total market we've done our in total international we've got a couple of bond funds you know but i really like real estate i want to add a little bit more real estate fine that's icing on the cake Put a little bit more real estate in your Roth. Put a little more real estate in your ta uh, tax deferred account. I wouldn't use it in your taxable account because it's not really tax efficient. Or maybe you like a little bit of factor exposure, small cap value, fine. Put that in your Roth account because the expectation of return is higher. So you wanna get the more growth oriented investments in your Roth. Uh, and that's what, um, that's what I call the icing on the cake. Do you need a lot of this? It, no, but you do need to be long-term. If you're going to add some icing to your cake, you do need to be invested in that strategy for 20 to 25 years. I mean, it's a, like a lifelong investment strategy. Personally, I have three icings on my cake. I have a small cap value fund. I have a, a little bit in a real estate investment trust fund, and I have a, a little bit of preferred stock. And so those are my three icings on the cake. And I don't really want to get into preferred stock. It's really a niche area of the market, but I have it. So those are my three icings on the cake. And I've had them for many years and I expect to keep them for many years. And that's, uh, you know, if you, if you decide to have that, you don't have to, you can just stick with the three fund portfolio. No one's going to say that that's not going to outperform me and it might outperform me. I'm taking a risk with those other, with the icing on the cake. I'm paying a little bit higher fee to have that icing on the cake. Is it gonna outperform the three fund portfolio? I don't know. I really don't know. I have no idea. But for me, for my strategy, that's me personally, what I've decided to do. And uh, that's what I've been doing for a long time. So that's the icing on the cake. And there's a lot of people that provide these funds, you know, iShares, Vanguard, Schwab. And people say to me, which one should I use? And my answer is, they're all good. I mean, like iShare total stock market index fund, it's literally the same as the Vanguard Total Stock Market Index Fund. Actually, the Charles Schwab REIT Fund is the cheapest REIT fund out there, even cheaper than the Vanguard REIT Fund, the ETF. So there's a lot of great product out there at a lot of different places. In an ETF form, you can buy them. doesn't matter where you are. You could be at Schwab and you could be buying Vanguard ETFs or iShare ETFs. It uh, does, doesn't really matter. You can be at Fidelity. You can buy, buy these things. So a lot of, lot of good quality uh, investments out there, but we want to keep it down to a simple portfolio, you know, three funds, four funds, maybe five funds, probably not any more than that. And, and just keep it simple. So the last is discipline. So I have my philosophy. I've created my strategy. Now what? Discipline. And what does discipline begin with? Well, you've got your plan. We know what we're going to do. Uh, you know, we, we, now we have to do our plan. And the first thing on that is you got to get it implemented. I mean, so many times <laughs> I, I see people who come up with a great plan, great investment policy statement. I mean, just eye watering stuff. And then I look at their portfolio and it's not invested. <laughs> okay, okay. This is a great plan. When are you going to invest it? Oh, I'm, you know, I'm waiting for the market to turn down or. You know, I think interest rates are going to continue to go up or I don't know, on and on and on, a million excuses of why this thing doesn't actually get implemented. Like, just just get it done. Bite the bullet, get the plan implemented. It's so much easier if you can just get it implemented and then you can stay the course. So, you know, your investment success isn't what happened last week or last year. It's what happens over your lifetime. I, tell, I try to tell people what matters, wait, the market today, Yes, interest rates have gone up. Yes, the stock market has gone down. Should you invest 
the money that you've got sitting in cash, absolutely you should invest it. I mean, you think it's gonna make any difference over your lifetime, whether or not you invest this week or next week or the week after, it's not gonna make any difference. Get it implemented, get that cash in the market. But of course, it's gonna be times when the market is not gonna cooperate. We're going to have a roller coaster in the market. And what do you do when that happens? Well, this is what a lot of people do, right? You've seen this great cartoon, I don't know how, is, but it's a normal day at the most important financial institution. I think they were talking about the New York Stock Exchange where, you know, there's rumors galore. Hey, is Elon Musk actually going to buy Twitter or not? This is important to all of us, correct? It's going to make a decision whether we invest today. Well, that's, that makes no difference whatsoever, but they make it appear in the media like it's important. Well, you know, news is equal weighted. In fact, it, it, it's actually weighted towards what the most sensational thing is, right? Now, but how important is that to us as investors? How important is it whether Elon Musk buys Twitter or not? It has zero relevance in our life at all, okay? But it's meant to, you know, be new. So news, the, the, the weighting of news is not correlated in any way, form or fashion to the weighting of the uh, S&P 500 or the weighting of the market. If it was, all the news would be about Google and Apple and Facebook, but it's not. It's all about all these other things. So we don't, we gotta ignore all of this noise and we just gotta get invested and stay the course. As Jack Bogle said, his last book was called Stay the Course. Uh, I did a podcast on this back about a little over three years ago. I, I had the great opportunity to talk with uh, Jack a few months before he died and we, and we went over his book. So if you go to the Bogleheads on investing podcast, number one, uh, you'll hear this interview uh, with Jack and it was a, just a wonderful interview. So what do you, should you be doing to wrap up the discipline side? You're gonna continue to educate yourself. You try to automate as much as you can about investing and you hibernate. Just let it go. Don't be changing it. This is a lifelong investment strategy. If you leave it alone, if you just let it work, let your strategy work, maintain the philosophy, maintain the discipline, stay the course, you'll come out further ahead. Now that's the three parts of being a successful investor. If you have the philosophy, you develop your strategy, you get it fully implemented and you maintain it. That's that works. That's that worked in the past. It's going to work going forward. Now, I, I did this book and I'm working on this book, not just for you to sort of remind you of the things that we're supposed to be doing, but really um, I'm writing this book as something to hand down to other people. In other words, I'm trying to, in the book that, that I'm working on and with, with this presentation, I'm trying to give you ideas or how to help other key people become enlightened about this, how to help people manage their own portfolios. It's hard. People are just intimidated by this stuff. I've been trying to make it as simple as we can. It's not difficult. Oh, it is difficult. I shouldn't say it's not, but it is difficult. And taxes are difficult. But once you get it, once you see the idea of an, the philosophy, once you can put together a simple strategy. And once you can get that implemented, maintaining that strategy is actually not difficult at all. And, and when you get to that point with your portfolio, pass it on, talk with others about it, help others, help your family members. Now, will they listen? No, not going to listen. Okay. But they are listening. Let me tell you my philosophy about this. It takes a hundred touches before somebody gets it. They have to hear about this a hundred different times, often from many different places before they actually stop and look and then before they actually take notice. So every time you happen to bring it up, it's just another iteration towards that 100. And finally, when they get to that 100, they're actually going to take a look. So whatever you're doing out there is important, even though you feel like no one is listening. You just got to do it over and over and over again. The truth must be repeated over and over again because lies are constantly being told around it.